Welcome to the Zealous Podcast. I'm your host, Rocky Snyder. This week, I've got Jeff Conkle in the house with me. He's in charge of player performance and strength and conditioning for the Las Vegas Golden Knights. But before we get underway, be sure to check out my workshop coming up this November. It'll be November 3rd in Santa Cruz County, California. Posture-based soft tissue mobilization. How we affect the body by targeting certain areas with soft tissue. And you can do that simply by understanding where the pressure is in someone's feet. Also, go to satanticollege.com. If you're interested in higher learning, you can get a Master's of Science in Performance Coaching. They also have tracks in sports injuries and return to performance management, as well as applied sports biomechanics and movement science, and applied sport and exercise psychology. satanticollege.com. Enter RS10 as a coupon code and get 10% off today. Follow us on Instagram at Rocky underscore Snyder, and enjoy the show. Well, Jeff, for, thanks for coming on to Zealous. Uh, nice in the cooler climates of Vegas. How warm is, is it there right now? Uh, near record. I uh, got the little app down at the bottom. It's 104 degrees today. Oh, you better wear a jacket. Things are cooling down for sure. And uh, well, how, first of all, how do you like living in Vegas? I, I really like it. I, I hate being cold. Uh, one of my goals was always to leave the... Uh, the north and so I, I'm, I'm loving it here not too much huh where, where were you in the great white north where did you grow up i grew up um, from columbus ohio originally so cold but not not uh nothing like uh, the great white north of uh, winnipeg or edmonton or anything <laughs> well columbus yeah they've got their share of overcast cold days for sure and but it, give me an, a rundown of how you got from Columbus to Vegas, what's and first of all, your role in, with the Vegas Golden Knights is the associate director of player performance development, as well as being one of the strength conditioning coaches. So, um, how did you go from growing up in Columbus, finding your passion, what happened, and then pursuing it to where you are now? And remember, can you do it in a minute or less? No, I'm just kidding. Just see if you could give me a rundown. Yeah, so for a quick rundown, I was, uh, in, you know, an average high school athlete, limited uh, skill, really tried hard in the, the weight room to uh, to optimize my uh, my performance. And uh, I, I went to Ohio State uh, on an academic scholarship. I had always intended to do uh, uh, med school there or med school somewhere. Um, and I, I thought exercise science would be sort of a, a fun pre-med uh, education pathway. I can learn about uh, how to optimize, you know, my own personal training and have a strong interest in uh, the obesity epidemic. So, you know, what, how could we help, uh, you know, a lot of my fellow Americans, uh, you know, return to uh, a healthier lifestyle and, a, you, know, you know, higher functioning lifestyle, better aging process. So that was sort of my, uh, my interest that got me into exercise science. Uh, and uh, as an exercise science undergrad, I, I took uh, an undergrad job as a group fitness instructor. Uh, so oh. I, I thought, uh, you know, looking back on it, I think that was very helpful in moving into, you know, coaching large groups of people because uh, you kind of have to get very comfortable with that, uh, making exercise modifications on the fly, that sort of uh, that, that sort of deal, uh, coaching many people that you don't know all at once. Um, so that, I think that was a, a kind of a fun, accidental uh, start into the, the pathway of being a strength coach. Um, then uh, sort of for, you know, my own selfish personal reasons, I, I kind of was curious what uh, the Ohio State strength conditioning program uh, was doing to, uh, you know, enhance the uh, the workouts and the athleticism of the Ohio State athletes. So I just reached out and asked if I could come shadow and uh, I started uh, shadowing the uh, Ohio State Olympic sports program. Uh, wow I okay I gotta pause there. Ohio State the Buckeyes like they are synonymous with athletic pursuits championships I mean there you just think of some of uh, the top schools in Ohio State, whether it's gymnastics, by the way, gymnastics is huge at Ohio State, but uh, amazing. And you just kind of just said, hey, what the heck? I'm just going to do this. I'm going to see if Alice Cooper wants to hang with me. And and you uh, you basically got a reply and they said, yeah, come on over and hang. 
Yeah. Uh, my uh, professors and some of the strength coaches that worked with each other previously. So, you know, we kind of picked the, uh, the social network a little bit and, and they, they said, welcome over. And uh, that kind of continued into my undergrad, like, you know, official internship with the uh, Ohio State Olympic Sports Program. Uh, and it, it went well. It was fun. Uh, I think a lot of the skills that I had developed as a group fitness instructor were very applicable um, and sort of that being comfortable moving into a large group of coaching of people that you don't already know. Um, so, yeah, that was uh, it was really enjoyable. Had uh, really good mentors there. Um, I bet. You know, Coach Glass, uh, Coach Anthony Glass, Coach uh, Andy Britton, uh, Coach Tom Palumbo, uh, Coach Luke Tipple were all uh, excellent in their own ways. And uh, I feel like they all took me under their wing and, and were very willing to share their expertise and their experience. Uh, so uh, and Olympic sports being track and field, uh, what, cycling, gymnastics, what, what sports are you covering there? Uh, a, a, a litany because I, I just tried to to be available. Um, so yeah, track and field, men's and women's, uh, men's and women's volleyball, uh, men's ice hockey, uh, women's ice hockey. No, sorry, not women's ice hockey. Edit on that one. My bad. Um, oh no, I, I did do some work with them, but it wasn't as much. Uh, so it's a long time ago. So it's racking my brain a little bit. Uh, the first the first team I got to coach actually for was the uh, pistol and rifle team. I got a little bit of uh, personal uh responsibility there i think because you know they're kind of uh what do you do to train Yeah, hold them? the phone on that okay i just finished watching olympic pistol shooting i don't know if i've ever really watched it before um and i swear one guy put the cigarette down and stepped up to the target uh i, I don't know if that was a if it was just something that was out of the corner of my eye maybe he would just had something else in his hand but when it comes to that sport or competition what did that look like for as an intern and working with those individuals, what did you, what was that all about? So it was interesting, you know, as, as uh, when you shoot, you want to rely on bony end fields. So you don't really want to train them to be muscularly stable. You don't want, you know, muscular stability. You actually want to be kind of locked into your bony frame. Uh, oh. So uh, mobility to make sure that you're flexible enough to lock into the bony frame in different positions. Uh, and then, you know, aerobic fitness to have a lower heart rate really is the, those are my thoughts on how to train for those, for the, the shooting sports. I love that. I don't think I've ever asked anybody a question of that sort. Okay. Sorry. Keep going. No, no, no I just, that... It was a cool was opportunity. Awesome. I, I, you know, I think that they were sort of, uh, in there a little bit because their, uh, their coach didn't want to use all of their hours for shooting and he just kind of passed him over for a little bit of like, Hey, make these guys do some stuff. And I was the intern that was there that day. And, uh, I, I like to shoot guns. So, uh, I, I had actually taken the coaches, um, riflery course at Ohio state. So I, I kind of already knew the coach from taking his courses to try to, you know, learn how to shoot better as well. So, right on. Uh, so that some of the, those thoughts are are from him a little bit as well about the wanting to be in the bony end fields and not wanting muscular stability. That's very cool. Okay, Ohio State, you spend your four years or so there, and then uh, how do you leave? Where do you go? So uh, very much uh, serious timing for me. Uh, I got offered to be a GA to come back and uh, teach and research for my master's degree at Ohio State. And the Blue Jackets reached out to the Olympic sports coaches at Ohio State and asked for uh, qualified candidates to intern with the Blue Jackets. So I was able to kind of merge those two opportunities. Uh, you know, you mentioned like doors just kind of falling open. Both of those opportunities presented themselves almost at the exact same time. And I was able to do both. Uh, my uh, faculty members, uh, Dr. Dever, uh, really inspiring uh, professor for me, uh, and Kevin Collins were, you know, able to work it out together that, uh, you know, that would be an independent study coursework for me uh, to be a strength coach there. And I would be able to do my GA work in the afternoons, evenings. So I did that oh, for, uh, for two years 
very, very busy two years being a, basically a full-time strength conditioning coach for an NHL team and a full-time GA and full-time student. Uh, but it went, it went well. It was, uh, you know, hard work, but enjoyable. And uh, right about as I was graduating, another kind of stroke of good luck, the Blue Jackets minor league strength conditioning coach, uh, you know, wanted to leave and pursue going back to uh, physical therapy, doctor of physical therapy school. Uh, so the, the job became available and I, I applied. I'm not sure if anyone else did. And I got that role. <laughs> I'm sure there's probably a few applicants there, but that's great. And then <clears throat> basically from the Blue Jackets, it seems like every two years you move from one team to the next as head strength conditioning coach, the Springfield Thunderbirds, then on to the Cleveland Monsters, the Chicago Wolves before landing in Henderson, Nevada with the AHL team. That's their, the, the G League or development team for the Golden Knights, which are the Henderson Silver Knights, right? That's correct. And, and yeah, the, uh, I, was, I was actually only been the minor league strength coach for the Blue Jackets and then the minor league strength coach for the Golden Knights. Uh, both of those clubs just uh, changed their minor league affiliation. So it required me to move to uh, a different city with a new team while keeping the same role with the same players. God, oh, so I see. All right. And then eventually with the NHL teams, their AHL affiliates – that were primarily Midwest and in, in the East Coast, Northeast, especially, they began to see that, okay, we can move out and be closer to our our, our mother team or our, our parent team, so to speak, in the NHL. Like I, I know the San Jose Sharks have the San Jose Barracudas who moved out here not too long ago. Uh, Henderson, of course, the same. I mean, that must be quite nice in terms of having both organizations proximity and so on. But Somewhere along the way, you became a performance development specialist. Give me a rundown, a little definition in your own mind, your own words. What does that entail? So that was uh, sort of uh, the Golden Knights uh, honoring me with an additional title to signify uh, working beyond the scope of just the AHL uh, head strength coach and having a focus on our prospect development. So in in hockey, we, we draft guys at 17 or 18 years old, and then they can't generally become pros until around 20. And then their entry level contract runs to about 23. You, you know, there's, there's a lot of exceptions to all of these things, but the general pathway is drafted at 17, 18, uh, able to become a, a AHL professional at 20, uh, entry level contract with a waiver exemption running to 23, restricted free agent, you know, two year bridge deal getting to 25. So uh, it, I break that down just because we have like a, almost a guaranteed seven years with every athlete we draft if we want it. Wow. Uh, so I've always thought um, there's sort of a, a, an oversight in the way a lot of uh, teams approach the long term athletic development opportunity that that presents. So in Columbus, when I was an intern, one of the, uh, the things that I tried to make my own and, and do a good job with was working with the drafted, uh, drafted prospects that kind of didn't fall in the purview of the NHL or the AHL head strength coach that we had at the time. Uh, and then a lot of those guys became the athletes on my team uh, when I was the AHL head strength coach for Columbus. And I just sort of, uh, there was no one else to do that job. We didn't have um, as many other intern options that kind of to follow me into that intern role. So I, so I kept doing it. Uh, when I got to the Golden Knights, we had Gary Roberts to do that role for the first three years. So that was, uh, it was very nice, actually. It was a big workload off my plate. Uh, and then uh, when Gary Roberts left, the, the Golden Knights organization to, pr pr uh, to pursue other opportunities. Uh, they, you know, uh, the Jay Millette, my director, had known that that's something that I had interest in and had done before and, you know, asked me if I would be willing to take it on. And I said yes, as long as I get some sort of uh, title growth and, and growth in the organization to do so. So, in, in essence, you've developed kind of an LTAD program from 17 to 24 year old athletes. 
Am I yeah. getting that right? Yeah, I, yeah. I I would say I I sort of started it and uh, started working on that sort of project in 2011 with the Blue Jackets, and if so that's you know something that I've I think I've done well, and it's sort of become a niche for me. Uh, I'm not intent, not exactly by intentional act, but uh, just some uh, a hole that I saw needed filled. So uh, I tried to fill it to you know give the NHL team the best chance at being successful. And how about other organizations, other teams, that is? Are they seeing what you've been doing? Because, I mean, granted, there was the expansion, Golden Knights established themselves, and within, I don't know, if it was the first year? Was it the first season they were around that they won the Stanley Cup? Unfortunately not. We got to the Stanley Cup finals uh, and lost okay. to the Washington Capitals. Uh, it was very, right. very, okay. very exciting first year. Uh, yeah. Know, no, one, no one really knew exactly what to expect. Um but uh, the, uh, I think our, our Golden Knights management did an incredible job with trades and player acquisition and uh, kind of accumulating a lot of pick capital that then they could reuse. So it was, it was a cool thing to watch from, you know, I, I started watching outside as a Blue Jackets employee and then got to uh, kind of come inside and, and see the, the success that that wrought as a Golden Knights employee. Well, and so with that, and it's extended season after season, the Golden Knights have been in the, the the top five, at least, in the West. I think with every season, they're always up there. They're always making the playoffs for such a young organization. So are eyes turning toward you and the program that you developed? I mean, do you have colleagues and on other teams that are going, hey, I understand you got this program. Can we talk about it? I, or are you going, not, hey, uh, no way, man. This is my baby. I'm not letting anybody have it. I I don't, uh, you know, I think it's it's not as secret as, you you know, you would like to think. It's it's just hard work and consistent effort, uh, good education of, of your prospects. It's doing the basics extremely well uh, is, is very effective, is what I would say. And so what are the basics? And I don't mean just the physical development because you're getting teenagers who are leaving home that aren't completely mature physiologically and mentally and culturally. I mean, you've, you've got to have a, be a multifaceted approach. Uh, how in trend, how, how in depth are we talking? Yeah, so uh, you know, NHL teams have development camps uh, every summer, and that we we get to see them in person at these development camps. So, I've always been a big proponent of using that time to really try to educate uh, athletes on proper lifestyle in terms of you know uh, at different development camps. We've done a lot of different things, but uh, I think I view it as uh, you know sort of my collegial background. I I, I loved teaching and I, I tried to teach uh during that time you know teach movement teach nutrition teach uh sleep hydration supplementation uh so you, you know the uh the things that you know if you do these basics very well consistently over the time from your 18 to 20 we can have you much more ready to step into your your, your professional career you know hopefully bigger faster stronger than your peers that don't take that uh you know focus time when no one's making them do it, you know, that's kind of the, uh, and then there's just a lot of communication. You, you, you stay in touch, uh, make sure that the players know that you're available as a resource, reach out to them frequently and um, see how things are going that way that, you know, that's an issue that they might not reach out to you about. You can uh, hear about once you reach out to them and address it, educate uh, based on whatever that issue is. And so the role that you stepped into moving from Henderson to the NHL in Las Vegas, what, what have you taken on more of, or was it just kind of a lateral shift into a, a more notable position? I mean, did you take on a higher role and responsibility, not just the, because of the level of players, but you know, what does this entail? So one of the things that was, uh, as I mentioned before, it's, you know, being a team's head strength coach, being an AHL head strength coach is a, it's a demanding hour intensive travel intensive job. Uh, and then 
doing a good job at staying in touch with all of your prospects is a intensive, you know, felt like second full-time job. Uh, mm -hmm. So for me, it was, uh, you know, kind of saying that I'm trying to please two masters with uh, this role. And I, I think that I could do a better job at the prospect development role, which I think is extremely important. Uh, if I have more time to dedicate it to it, uh, and uh, you know, I, I, you know, my, the goal as a, as a professional is to move up to higher levels. So uh, I was trying to be an NHL, and, you know, strength and conditioning coach. So I, th I thought by you know, moving away from being a team's head strength conditioning coach, and uh, I would be able to move up level and uh, provide better. Uh, service delivery to the prospects. Sure. I can see that, but boy, that's so what's uh give me a, give me a rundown of your daily routine. You wake up at two 45 AM and your head hits the pillow at midnight or what are we talking? It, it definitely felt like that for a lot of years. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm not a, I'm very, you know, very much not a morning person by nature, but uh, sports kind of forces it on you. Uh, so I, I, uh, I'm not one of the gets up early and works out. I usually get up and, uh, meditate, uh, walk the dogs, cook breakfast, that sort of thing. Uh, it's, it's nice in season when we have provided breakfast. So that gives you a little bit more time to sleep. Um, yeah, I usually try to have at least a, you know, a bit of time and, and motion in the morning to, to clear my mind and, and focus on the tasks that I need to accomplish that day. Uh, head into the rink. Usually, uh, there's, you know, the, the strength conditioning set up and organize the weight room and, uh, the activities required for the day, all that sort of thing. And then, uh, coach, coach athletes through what, uh, whatever is the intended intervention that day, uh, you know, the, the, the fun, exciting part of the job, the reason you, you signed up. Right. And then there's the, uh, data recording the other stuff. stage. Yeah. Then there's the other stuff, data recording stage, <laughs> office work. Uh, that I, I usually use that time to, uh, uh, reach out to prospects, uh, reach out to, uh, you know, vendors, that sort of thing, sort of the, the office side of the thing. And then I am, a, I'm a afternoon workout person. So that's the, you know, kind of about, uh, eat a little bit of a late lunch and then, about 60 minutes later, you get to, uh, you get to training. Okay. In your position, what's your superpower and what's your kryptonite? Uh, my superpower is, uh, I would say, you know, being, being relatable, being friendly and being present. You know, I, I really, I really like to be on the floor with the athletes the whole day. If there's an athlete in the weight room, I don't, I don't like to be in the office. I want to, I want to be out with the athletes The you know, there's one athlete out on the floor. I want to be out on the floor with them. Uh, and then that's, it's kind of also the kryptonite because then that signs me up to <laughs> sit back at the computer for a lot longer in the afternoons. Oh yeah. Yeah. So, uh, how, you say you've got dogs. Does that mean you've got two, three, I got, four, yeah, how many two, dogs? Uh, two, two big golden doodles. They're, uh, they're, they're pretty fun. Because they get me to and, do a lot of a uh, lot more walking volume than I probably would otherwise. Do they get to go to work with you? They have before. When I was a Chicago Wolves employee, I would take I would take my dog in pretty frequently. She was kind of like a, a team dog one season, uh, and then they'll they'll make uh, occasional appearances, usually in the off season. Now, um, you said the Chicago Bulls. Were you with the Bulls organization? Uh, Chicago the Wolves. Sorry. Oh, the Wolves. Now it's my hearing. That's all right. Wow. Yeah. And so they they prefer to kind of stay at home. Uh, I, they love the rink. I mean, they're they're, uh, they're a whole lot. They're a bit of a distraction. Yeah. So. <laughs> okay. Um, biggest challenge coming up for this season that you're facing right now, and that you're looking forward to overcoming or dominating. Um. Biggest challenge: sleep deprivation. That's uh. That's a, you know, every hockey season, you, you're going to be working late, uh, 
waking up early on repeat, uh, trying to stay the healthiest individual you can as well with uh, your own workouts and your own energy level. Um, so, you know, nap when you can, uh, realize when there's going to be short sleep, sometimes modify your own exercise intensity down when you know you're going to be tired. Uh, one of the, the things I love most about my, my current role is uh, the, the less travel. I, after years of riding the bus as an AHL head strength coach, lots of nights on the bus, I, I really in, am enjoying a, a reduction in my travel volume, which is uh, less, sleep, less sleep deprivation. But I think that's the, the hardest thing for uh, you know, professional hockey uh, staff member is, is, is the, the total hour demand and the late nights and early mornings combined. Now, do you travel with the Golden Knights at all when the season comes around? Will you be traveling? I, I don't. Uh, so that's uh, uh, wow. you know a large uh, perk of my of my current role for myself. I, I really am enjoying being a little bit more of a uh, homebody and uh, taking the time when the team's on the road to to really accomplish a lot more of the the prospect stuff. And how many prospects are we talking when you say prospects? Are we talking thirty? 20, 40? It, it depends. We've, we've traded uh, a number of our draft picks recently. So uh, we're, we're around, you know, 12 uh, currently, you know, as as the year goes on and maybe we might sign some additional people uh, for the Tahoe team. It, it could go up. It depends how you classify that role, uh, you know, who falls in the, uh, the purview of the AHL strength coach. But you know, if, if we say prospects as everybody underneath the NHL, which is sort of my previous definition, uh, you know, on their first one or two contracts, it would be more along the lines of, uh, you know, 22, 25, something like that. From three separate teams? Well, more than that. So it would be, you know, guys in major juniors, guys in college, guys in European pro teams. Uh, oh. Guys in the East Coast League, guys in the American Hockey League, kind of. Wow. Okay, so how does it filter down to you? Does the GM contact you? Does the head coach or assistant coach go, here are the guys we're looking at and need you to reach out and do that? How does, if if there was like an or organizational chart or a flow, how does that work? So we have, we have Will Nickel, our director of player development, and uh, he's fantastic. He really... Uh, is is super passionate and sort of does the uh, I would say like the hockey and a lot of the life development side of the player development. So he's he's in contact with these guys a lot. He's traveling to see them, watching their games. Uh, you know, kind of being uh, somewhere in between a, an older brother and a father to, to these guys. Like he's he's uh, he works extremely hard and he's very diligent uh, at this role and. So, you know, I'll, I'll contact them on my own and then we'll, we'll powwow pretty frequently and make sure that, uh, you know, these guys may have told him things they haven't told me or vice versa. So we can kind of, uh, sorry about that. My no. dog sleeps the same way. My dog has, <laughs> has fun dreams and, and they sound the same right now. So they're, they're chasing a bone or something. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. I love the sound of dogs sleeping like that. Um, so if you looked back over your career at Ohio State as a student, knowing what you know now and in the position that you're in, are there some college courses that you'd go back and take to kind of fill in the gaps, if there are any, within your mind? Absolutely. I, I, there's a course that I really wanted to take, actually. Uh, it was a hard, very hard course. Uh, my, my business school friends took it. It was computer science and engineering 200. I tried hard to get access to it as a grad student. Uh, it was basically, you know, Excel boot camp. Ah. And uh, like, you know, my sister is a, a, a Ohio State business grad and she's a wizard, you know, in an Excel sheet. So uh, I've had to be somewhat, you know, self-taught YouTube channels, books. Uh, but I, you know, I, I was already working uh, as a you know professional intern with the Blue Jackets and saw like how valuable this tool would be to a strength conditioning professional. Um, I, you know, my, my personal bias is that Excel is way better than almost all of the AMSs that exist. And, you know, if you 
if you can either engineer it yourself or, you know, get a third party engineer to, to build you the Excel that you need for what you want, you know, this is a, a major, you know, fortune 500 level enterprise instead of like a niche small market product. So, yeah, I, I wish I could have taken that. I tried, I tried hard to take it. I needed to gain access to the business school uh, to take it, unfortunately. So that, that one, that one stand jumps out uh, when you ask that question. Yeah, that's, that's, it's really kind of funny because uh, I'm not a Fortune 500 company. I'm a little boutique training facility in a, a quiet surf town on the California coast. But I have tried so many management systems. Some are, you know, the devil that you know versus the devil that you don't know. It's, it's which is the lesser of the evil, so to speak, whether it's software management for the business, program design, you say, and in the end, uh, we're relying on Google Sheets or Microsoft Excel. These spreadsheets are because they conform to what you need them to. So it's very interesting to know that uh, you're kind of in the same boat as well. And in order to hone your craft, to sharpen your skills, so to speak, and the position that you're in, what are you pursuing is in terms of whether it's YouTube videos or if it's going back to school or if it's a correspondence course or just a book, is it the, the language of coaching, the aspects of better communication? Is it uh, the importance of um, sleep? Where, where is it that in your spare time, which is very limited, I understand, where are you looking to improve upon what you're doing? So uh, I just started to, uh, you know, reflect on this, this off season and I haven't taken that many, you know, steps at it, but uh, I feel very confident in uh, my abilities as a, as a strength conditioning coach uh, and, and the, the tools and resources for, you know, strength development, movement training, those sort of things. Uh, and I think to, to better myself, but uh, the focus to shift to, uh, better management of people uh, in this, this uh, uh, the role that I'm in currently. I, I do uh, oversee the the AHCHL strength coaches, and uh, that's my first role of actually managing somebody else. So uh, that's that's sort of my uh, my focus. Once the uh, the season gets started, I want to uh, to dive into that a little bit in my my personal reading time. Do you guys ever do any like uh, Myers Briggs? I was going to say Briggs and Stratton, but that wasn't it. But um, Enneagrams, any kind of personality assessments to know the types of people you work with and uh, how you pair up, how you work well together, where you're challenged. Do you guys? I'm just curious. I don't know about other sports organizations, but you guys are have been champions um, a few times over here. So I'm just curious. I, I did some of that at Ohio State uh, in the uh, group fitness program. Actually, that was something that uh, really that was that was there, uh, and as well as the exercise science department. I, I haven't done that in the the pro sports venue at all. Um, oh, yeah, it's not. No, no. that's not all right. I'm just that curious. Would, uh, not something that I would personally probably push for. I, I do know our 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 director now, uh, Steve McCauley. Uh, you know, sort of has a, a history of management in, in other ways, and he likes the uh, uh, he, he does he has an interest in that. I don't want to say um, the wrong thing, but he, he uh, that is something that he he is interested in. I think maybe starting to to layer into to what we do. And a lot of people think, oh well, it's the off season right now. NHL is not going to get underway for about six more weeks. I mean, first game's not until October or is it the first week of November? When's the first game? Uh, early October. Uh, early October. Yeah. yeah. So but, right we now start, uh, training camp uh, for rookies on the 11th and for main camp on the 18th. So we're, we're, we're coming right up to the edge of the off season here. Guys are, you know, I think guys all around the league are working very hard to be prepared for, for the camps. That's kind of what I'm getting at. Most people think, oh, it's the off season. Everyone's relaxed. The players are, are somewhere in the Virgin Islands kicking back with some mimosas or whatever. But no, this is the time that you're really uh, just getting down and dirty with your preparation time. So uh, when is it? Is it the 
middle of June to the middle of July that you come up for a breath or when when do you feel like you can take a breath before before things just go nuts on you? Well, uh, it, so it sort of depends when whenever your season ends. Uh, I mean, it, with my role with prospects, season ends in a rolling uh, go. So your season might be over, but they might be, you know, in their week one and you need to set up a program, talk to their strength coach. But generally when the season ends, you have a, a little bit of a, a downtime, a couple weeks from your, your main squad, uh, you know, reduced work hours, not going in every day, that kind of thing. And then uh, the development camp usually follows the draft. So that's the first week of July or so. Then, uh, you know, like the second two weeks of July, maybe it's a, it's a little bit light. Those are usually the, the time I usually peg for a, a personal vacation. Dev camp is over. You've kind of onboarded new athletes, reached out to their, uh, you know, strength and conditioning coach for the off season, that sort of thing. And then you can sort of, uh, they, you know, make sure your new program phases are out and then take a, take a little bit of a break there. Well, being in Vegas and the second week of July or so, I think your timing is perfect to get the heck out of Dodge there. My it, gosh. Is. It, it is. It is not, you know, if you stay around uh, Vegas at that time of year, it, it is, it can be uncomfortably warm. We had, uh, we had a new record this year of 122 right about that time. It was that day was uncomfortable. Yeah. That's called prison. It, it's not called freedom at all. So, okay. Your prospects, They've got their conditioning programs. They've got their coaches. How often is there a butting of heads? How often are, do, uh, do you have to address uh, ego, for lack of a better word? Like, do you, do you run into conflict with other organizations, other teams that you've got prospects coming from? Or do you just kind of smile and nod your head and say, okay, that's great. And wait till they get here. And then we're going to put them through what they really need. Yeah, I mean, uh, occasionally that happens. I feel like just in, like regular life, most people are amenable. You're not, uh, you know, if you if you try to package what you're asking for in a way that's uh, manageable and not extremely time sensitive from them, you know, I, I like to give, you know, these are other strength conditioning professionals I'm speaking with. They're qualified to have the jobs that they have. And, you know, you kind of... Uh, uh, approach it just like anything in life, a friendly manner. Uh, here's the, you know, objective testing results that we saw with our guys. And here's what we think would, you know, help their development the most. Uh, here's the ways that we would think about working on them. What, what is feasible in your facility and your, in your time scope, how can we help? Uh, I, I think that's the, the way to minimize, you know, friction points. Um, and then when those friction points, uh, you know, occasionally occur, at the end of the day, you don't really have control power. So you, you, you have to do your best to, uh, you know, be persuasive and, uh, you know, get a win for everyone. You know, that's a, like, come to a compromise that works for both sides uh, that you feel comfortable. Sure. Nice. Okay. W when it comes to kind of developing somewhat of a needs analysis on prospective players, <clears throat> with your prospects, what are the big buckets that you're looking for? And a, what I mean by that is sprint speed, uh, some kind of combine in the gym. Are there things that you're looking at, uh, aer aerobic recovery rates? Or what, what are the things that kind of are your big pillars that you're looking for and when you're deciding, okay, we need to enhance here, we need to improve here. Yeah. I mean, so as you mentioned earlier, it's, it's, you know, these guys are 18 when they come in. Uh, so almost all of them, you know, 90 plus percent of them are just not, you know, physical enough. Uh, they're not big enough. They're not strong enough. So the, the, the by far and away, uh, you know, obvious first answer is, you need to, you know, to get these guys and it's it can be very challenging because the, the better a hockey player is, the more they'll play hockey all year. So the, you know, the, the, the higher profile players will have, you know, more off season, you know, national camps and uh, they won't take the, 
you know, breaks because they'll have a national thing over here. So the, 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 the best youth, you know, not youth, but the best, uh, you know, 18 to 20 year old players will have the most hockey and often they play the most minutes. So that that sort of uh, volume of activity uh, often drives down the size that they are. So, you know, you're just, you're trying to find ways to help, you know, have them get the nutritional support uh, for their own development, uh, making sure they, they, you know, are remembering that, you know, even if they're tired, they need to get in their uh, strength training. Uh, and yeah, so it's uh, by far and away, we need to get them, you know, bigger, faster, stronger. Uh, and I'm sort of, uh, you know, Columbus, Ohio, West Side Barbell, uh, power expression is a uh, percentage of your one RM, right? So we need to, you know, that doesn't work infinitely, obviously, but, uh, you know, if you have a kid come in and, you know, we don't test in sort of and stuff. I'm not a big fan of that, but every training session itself is, a, is a test. So mm -hmm. you can see these guys moving with weights and, you know, you want to clean up their movement capacity, uh, to reduce the risk of overuse injuries. And you want to, uh, get them stronger at the, the, the basic movements. And what about it when it comes to the, uh, the seasoned veterans, the guys that are going to be aging out pretty soon? Uh, it, like, uh, guys in their late thirties, you would mean, or, um, how does it, yeah. How does it vary in terms of, you know, establishing a, a program or needs analysis? I mean, obviously these guys know what works for them. They have certain programs that have worked well for them. So, um, it may be a little bit more challenging to do different things with them and, and hope for a buy-in, but, uh, it's, it's obviously, I'm not going to say, obviously I'm curious are the programs different from the okay. the 18 and 19 year olds compared to the 33 year olds? Completely. And, and, and I think they should be right. I, I think you have right. that. I think, I think you're right. Like, obviously, yes, there's a, um, you know, you're not chasing endless improvements in a one RM, right? Like the taking a guy's squat from 200, 400 is going to yield you incredibly beneficial results. Taking a guy's squat from 500 to 600, is going to take so much work and effort and a high risk of injury. You know, there's a, every athlete is different, uh, but, you know, generally you're looking for, I would say the attainment of, you know, high, high level intermediate strength. And then you can kind of focus on uh, more uh, sports specific needs, uh, reduce, you know, training styles that reduce the risk of injury, that, that sort of thing. What about like a, tissue resiliency like how do you develop that I, obviously they're banging bodies they're banging boards they're hitting the ice there's it's already inherent within the sport itself but do you take it one step further off ice well so you know that's i think there's a few few things there that really stand out to me is uh i I have had the, uh, you know, the blessing of getting these guys after they've already been selected in the NHL draft. So these guys are, uh, or, you know, picked up as a free agent for a professional hockey team. So these guys have gone through juniors and college. And I think there's some level of selection for genetic recovery freaks in, in professional hockey. Oh, tell me more. Give me a little insight on that. I, you know, like these guys have had to play multiple games of hockey, many, you know, nine months of the season since they were children, and they still were able to recover and get stronger and get faster before I ever meet them. So there's, there's almost a, a weeding out process. Very, very rarely do I meet an athlete that, that, that gets to this level and has a challenge with that. Uh huh. And and, and, the, and the ones that I've met that have that issue have not been successful. Hmm. Ah, yeah, that makes complete sense. So as much as I would like to take credit for some, you know, glorious, complicated way of working on that, I think that the, the sport itself almost selects for that adaptive capacity in individuals. Now, correct me if I'm wrong but the Golden Knights injury rate was pretty low amongst most of the teams in the NHL last season. 
what do you attribute that low injury rate to? Well, we have a, a fantastic, uh, you know, athletic training and medical staff. Uh, we have, uh, we've had fantastic nutritionists and chefs. Um, you know, the, the organization is very supportive and in, in trying to manage the uh, schedule as much to allow, you know, rest and recovery. So I, I think there, you know, a lot more of that is outside of the weight room than inside of the weight room. Hmm. And, and travel being what it is, you know, if we look at the NHL, we'll find that the majority of teams are up in the Northeast or the Midwest in the Northern States. Granted, you know, we've got Carolina, Florida, Vegas, LA, uh, Dallas, and so on. They've spread out, but still within the group, I bring this up because the, the travel time is more intense for your team. You cover more time zones because you're further west, like all the West Coast teams and the East Coast teams are uh, those that are kind of like in the center of the, of the country don't have to a address so much change in that. Um, there, that travel, uh, that extensive amount of travel, how do you offset that also? Yeah, so uh, Vegas's uh, head strength coach, Doug Davidson, and, and I'll give a little uh, props to, to Aaron Heishman, our, our uh, you know, reconditioning uh, specialist head of reconditioning um you know they he does great work with getting the athletes back from injury in conjunction with the medical staff right and then and doug is a is a very uh you know highly intelligent creative uh strength coach and um he, you know and, and he's been able to uh help do things that I, I i think personally uh enhance the recovery and the adaptation to time zone and and I don't think I should talk too specifically about what those are, but I think he's, no. uh, he does a good job with that. Wow. Fantastic. Well, obviously, because th that is one of those, uh, the golden fleece that everyone's seeking out. You guys seem to have a, a, a good successful recipe with that. And just the fact that you've got, a, it sounds like you uh, being a humble person, didn't take any credit for anything we've talked about in the last five minutes. Uh, just, adds to it, but uh, you've got quite a collaborative team that sounds like you've really interwoven your disciplines very well together. You communicate well, and that's the sign of a good organization. So we're getting up to the end of the, the, the talk here. I'm just curious, you know, we connected through LinkedIn and I continue to follow you through there, but what about Instagram, other social media areas? Is there some, some information I can put in the description below the podcast where people can follow you, connect with you, reach out or whatever. Yeah. Uh, LinkedIn, uh, Jeff Conkle. And, uh, I mean, my Instagram is not exciting. I'm kind of, uh, uh, boring, non, non social media type person, but my, my Instagram is at Jeff Conkle. Uh, it, you know, if you, if you're, uh, if you more... love golden doodles, you're going to see a whole bunch of golden doodles on your site. I'm sure. No, not even. I, I, I don't think I've oh. posted in seven years, but uh, <laughs> I, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I do, uh, I, you know, I, I check my inbox there. I check my inbox on LinkedIn. I, I try to uh, make myself available to other professionals that want to connect uh, to help, you know, grow the field and, and have, a, a, you know, a, a growing web of communication in our field, I think is important. So, I am available for those two resources, but uh, right as far as content right, I'm putting out, I, I don't think you're going to be uh, too excited to see what I have there. Ah, well, I'll be the judge. But in the meantime, last question. Uh, when I come to Vegas, which show would you recommend going to see? Ooh, okay. So I am a big fan of uh, Mystere, the uh, Cirque ah, du Soleil show. I, uh, nice. I haven't been to... Uh, Oh, there's a, there's a sh absent. That's the show that I have uh, oh, had on my good. short list, but I have not been yet. So that it's still that at Caesars, show. right? It's in the parking lot at Caesars. Yeah. I've, I've heard from many people that that's the best Dude, show, uh, but you gotta I, go. I haven't made it yet. So this, so far for me, I've, I've liked this year. I've gone a couple of times uh, and nice. absent is on my short list. 
Absinthe is good. S sit in front if you can, right close to the little stage in the middle, and you'll have a freaking fantastic time. Who knows? Maybe the next time in Vegas, I'll just I'll knock on your door and we'll go together. This has been great. I can't thank you enough, Jeff, for coming on. I wish you tremendous success, continued success with the Golden Knights. Even though I'm a Sharks fan, I look forward to the time the teams come yeah, together good, and go head to head. Good rivalry, uh, yeah, absolutely. Heck yeah. We'll do this another time for sure. Awesome. Thanks, Rocky. Nice to meet you. You too. And that's a wrap for this episode of the Zealous Podcast. Thank you, Jeff, and the Las Vegas Golden Knights for making this happen. Remember, you can come on into Santa Cruz this November 3rd for a one-day workshop. It's CEUs for athletic trainers, physical therapists, chiropractors, strength coaches, and personal trainers. You get credit for all of those. Posture-based soft tissue mobilization. Check us out on RockySnyder.com. While you're at it, check out SatantaCollege.com, and if you get... You want to get 10% off your tuition, enter RS10. And we will see you next week.